sense of your next metaphor, I wondered what your underlying philosophical paradigm was. Yes. Yeah, there's a copy of this. Right. Great question. There are lots of paradigms out there within the Kepti, so there's. Well, I learned alcoholism at 12 or 13. Like, pragmatism is a major one, but there are lots of parts of pragmatism. But what I have morphed to over the years, in recent years, is something called critical dialectical pluralism, which is the idea for the pluralism side where you can use multiple words used within the same with the same framework. And that's quite often because most of the time in mixed methods, we don't do it alone. I mean, it's just not harder to do it by yourself, not skills that you need, not be struggling with qualitative or qualitative by yourself. So you work in the team. In fact, we just did a study on that. Looking over the last uh, eight years, we drove a research and found it was like you know, 2.6, something like that, and, uh, the, the number of core for some average. And uh, you know, more than 70% of the time, it's, it's uh, multiple authors. And so the idea that you might have in your team a constructivist, some form of constructivism, and a post positivist, one or more, and so the idea that you find a way to get some kind of commensurability. Um, and then the dialectical part is that, you know, is that um, speaking to that uh, you know, commercial ability and, uh, and um, so forth. Then the critical is that one of my concerns over the years, <coughs> of course, whenever you, you, you hear the word critical in, 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 as, a, as a framework, as a worldview, you think of power dynamics. So you have a lot of critical theories out there, critical theory, critical race theory, feminism, and so forth. All of those deal with the world at large. <coughs> As being, um, as being, you know, problematic and, and the problematizing power dynamics that happen. So, if it's feminist, for example, you look to see the role that power dynamics affect and, you know, and stop females from advancing and whatever. Um, but in the context of critical dialectical pluralism, we, we look at the research itself and the power dynamics that we have as researchers. We make all the decisions, as you know, from what a research question is going to be to how we're going to analyze the data, collect the data, how we're going to descend the data. So as critical back to close, we actually want to involve participants all the way through the process as much as possible in those decision making process. And that kind of allows me to you know that kind of fame of what I do. So tell me Shai, do you notice it's like this is very quiet because it's the student side. Are you in your classes that's how you are? <laughs> You're very quiet like that. I don't know all of you students, but say the back there. You, you don't say anything in your classes? You come in like this? Sorry? Okay. Because when I went to, I, I just recently came from uh, Japan, did a uh, presentation there, and there was silence, and they said that we never ever talk, because they believe that the, the professor is always right, and therefore, or I just, if I ask a question, it's like I'm challenging, or I am, might be insulting him or her. So I thought that was interesting. So I just wondered if, maybe it's not a, a cultural thing going on here that you're quiet. But anyway, yes. Uh, I have a question for, well, a general question. So uh, some of the, <clears throat> you talked about recommendation of keeping the scores of the evaluations uh, conf confidential. And I saw that some Spanish universities are beginning to publish the list of the best professors according to the ratings mm -hmm. in their web pages. So I don't know what you think about this practice. For keeping uh, results confidential? Yeah. yeah. yeah I'm an uh, advocate of uh, confidential use. Yeah. So I, I, I think it's okay that students get in one or another way informed on the general results of uh, student evaluations, <coughs> but I think, I don't think that uh, an SET report should be made public. I guess that uh, there's also, uh, certainly in Belgium, uh, there's lots of talking about, uh, between SET administra uh, administrators, the teachers, the dean, and so on, and uh, for instance, uh, the open-ended uh, comments, the open comments of students are not uh, spread. So that, that's only for use by the administrator and the teacher uh, and more yeah. yeah, I would definitely and I, th I, I think that, that, that this leads to a, a, a sphere of trust, <coughs> which I mentioned, in which a, 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 a teacher actually can use the results to 
uh, improve his or her sequence sequence teaching in life. Yeah, yeah just, just that we know that numbers take a life of their own, yeah. potentially. And yeah. so by, by documenting the number and making it available to everyone, um, that could lead to all, all kinds of things, especially those who don't get the higher number that could be really demoralizing, really embarrassing for them. And is that the goal of our evaluation to, to embarrass people? Is it to try to bring the best out of them and bring the best out of their teaching? Well, you know, it is, it is broadly a matter of trust and partnership. And, and uh, I think where there's a good sense of institutional cohesiveness, there should be transparency. And uh, um, this, this concept of accountability small a accountability and transparency means that we, we treat each other with respect, we treat each other as adults, um, and, uh, you know, uh, whether this institution is a public institution or a private institution, you pay for your education either directly or indirectly. You're, you're entitled to know about the quality of the teachers you're going to have, their teaching methods, and uh, I do believe that in some measure they are responsible to you, as you are responsible to them. So it's a, it's it's creating a dialogue and creating a sense of transparency and openness and trust is something we should we should strive for. So uh, what do we know when ratings are published? It, yes, indeed, students do elect courses on the basis of those published ratings, so it does influence course, course, course choice. Um, and you know, to say that handicaps teachers is well, you know, the flip side of that is: do we want handicapped teachers, or do we want handicapped students? Right, so. I think you're entitled to know. What's a reasonable, moderate uh, uh, position would be to say, uh, allow teachers the opportunity to teach a course for a few years and, uh, and keep the ratings private during the time that they're developing their teaching, or maybe before the first midterm term review of their teaching. But after that, there's that sense of, of <coughs> small case accountability that I think is important and should be respected. This is an institution that, I mean, post-secondary <coughs> education is not a hierarchical institution anymore. It should be a, a, a lateral institution. Interesting, I mean, I would say that numbers about context could be really dangerous. Um, if you don't know the size of the class or any of these things we talked about, you just post this number, it could be very misleading. Second point, one of the things I do um, is that every class I teach, I'll get one or two students who've taken me before, and they come into the class, I step out for 15, 20, sometimes even longer, and they can say what they like, and I never know what they say, and they could, that way, on day one, they kind of know what to expect. That way, they have that transparency and trust to do that, because many professors wouldn't do that, because they're allowing, they're, they could say whatever they like, oh, he was this, that, and the other. And then I get the students, the students to call me back when they're ready, and then I start the, start the semester. So that way they get to know, without even knowing what number I got, they can get the more, you know, more of the qualitative aspects of how I, how I teach. Um, I find that, that to, when I get feedback on that, they should say they find it to be really, really helpful because, you know, a stat course or, or even a qualitative <coughs> course or a mixed methods course can be very scary to a lot of students. Um, but when they get that, hey, I, you're going to go through, when they're told by these students, they're going to go through some times where, why did I take this class? And this teacher's so tough, and, but in the end, you're going to make it, and I made it, if I can, you can. That, you know, that's a lot more valuable to them than if I told them that. But so what you're just saying. But, but I'm not referring to numbers. Uh, some institutions are just putting a list of the best professors. Like, I'm not going to punish anyone, but I'm going to uh, put on, give information to the students about who are the best teachers along several years according to 
I don't know which is going to be the best solution, but I, I will say that the students need more information because they 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 deserve it at the end. They they need to know not necessarily the individual record of the professor, but at least maybe some information about which is the quartile where the professor has been during some years. I don't know, some kind of information. I know the numbers are dangerous, of course, because those num numbers are not perfect, but in some way we need to find a way to give a students more information about how we teach, uh, and I, but I don't know how. You are the expert, so maybe you have the answer. Yeah, I wish I was an expert. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, you raise a good point, and again, that, but that, that thing speaks more to qualitative information about a qualitative pro profile of each teacher versus this is the number which always scares me. Yeah. Uh, thank you for all the, uh, all the uh, seminars, the, the, all the participants for the seminar. That has been very reaching. And I would like to know one thing that uh, for me what's very interesting is to, to understand uh, the, to the importance of measuring the teacher efficacy for the, for the uh, formative assessment. Not only for the summative assessment, but for the for the, the formative assessment. Um, in in almost all, I think that uh, in almost all the, the your interventions, you have all, all of you said that uh, these instruments are only just one instrument to really accomplish or to understand what is the teacher efficacy. Uh, what would be what would do you think it would be uh, a good uh, uh, other good instruments to help teachers to really improve their teaching. Not only the, that instrument, but what other instruments would you think that it would be interesting? interesting. I will name two. Uh, the first one uh, are, as uh, you already mentioned, the peer, peer observations. Mm -hmm. That uh, professors who give the uh, same type of courses uh, as, as usual, or at least uh, uh, do research on some of the same things or the same subject matters uh, are in your room uh, are present in your room and can help you uh, with tips and even a written report of what they told of your lectures. And uh, second, uh, the, the observations by educational experts. So in almost every institution of, uh, of higher education, I think there are educational uh, developers uh, nowadays and instead of sitting sitting at their desks, they should be in your classroom and give you uh, advice and, and, and make an evaluation of you. So I think that that would be that would be two uh, good uh, co measures. Yeah. You were talking and some of the slides uh, that you projected this morning. You were talking also about the the, the students' uh, uh, activities or like the exams that they do or the activities or the diaries or whatever mm -hmm. that the students are doing. Uh, how would you measure that and how, how would you uh, evaluate that uh, to give feedback to the, to the teacher to learn how to improve their teaching? The single most powerful thing I do for myself, I've done it in every class from day one, I've been around a long time, um, is a journal. I get them to, to write a journal. Mm -hmm. And um, and they get like points to that towards a small amount of points, but still it's a freebie so for their time. And I learned so much from that. Doesn't necessarily help me with that that particular semester because I don't read it until after semesters and they they submit it on the last day of class after I turn in the grade, so I can, you know it doesn't bite me if they say things that are and they're incredibly honest. I mean I have never seen. I mean some of them will tell me you know the class went so badly today that. Uh, I didn't understand the day statistics class. I didn't understand the concept. I was in a bad mood. I got home and I argued with my wife. Or I took it out of my children. I mean, they really are. It's really compelling. Um, and so, those of you who ever tried that, um, might be worth trying, but you've got to be prepared to you know, um, deal with some negative response, positive response. But I made adjustments over the years. I've actually led some articles from that. So, it's another way to kind of publish work for those who are looking in that area. Um, another thing that is in the literature, I don't know if you came with that, something called a minute paper. Um, and that involves where for every class or selected class, you could just you know, give out an anonymous piece of paper and say, okay, they walked, ask a few questions, what worked, what didn't work, 
um, some of the software people pick up your questions and then you cut them up and then they catch you into your next class or, or series of classes. Um, that's another way. So it's not really, I won't use the, the concept of measurement, uh, but I use the concept of information. <coughs> and I have another question. If we just take the, the, the teacher evaluation as a summative, only in a summative way, mm -hmm. uh, do you think from your point of view that it, it should be the same uh, instrument for all the fields, used in, in all the fields, in, in different faculties? So it would be... Great question. No? That's a great question, thank you. I'm still undecided about that. I'm getting lean towards, based on the Name to research I've done begin to lean towards not having a one size fits all. Um, it's you know similar to yesterday we had some great presentations on uh, on the productivity and, 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 and look at journals like impact factors. You can't really compare impact factors across journals because you know a 2.5 in education is really good. A 2.5 in, in you know in in, in the uh, life sciences etc. Is, is that's really low. So it's similar to you know, it does concern me when we're trying to, I wonder if we have a phrase in England and in the US where we say comparing apples and oranges. I don't know if you have that phrase here, um, yes. especially as you have such nice oranges. And, uh, you know, it's something that um, I question. So so I can't give you anything definitive, but I, I, I really agree with you for raising that question. It's a very important one. Uh, do you know any, any experience or any survey that's being done? Yes, uh, uh, introducing uh, other aspects uh, when evaluating teaching efficacy with uh, educators, with, with uh, people with academics in education? Yes. Um, in Texas, for example, there's something called the IDEA, and uh, it's very controversial, but what they try to do is they'll look at some of the factors and actually give you an adjusted score mm -hmm. based on some of those factors. And they'll also say, it was interesting, who did it have the 15, you said 15 or more? Has, if that's 15 or more raters, I'm to do it in the slide. But you know, because some classes in the doctoral program, you might only, in the US, you might only have eight people or 10 people. And I like the fact it does give you a warning saying, you know, the sample size is small, so therefore the score, the score might not be valid. Um, because, you know. So your question was about some of the evaluation. Um, I think the preponderance of the evidence from the best validation studies suggests that the most uh, universal and generalizable items ask questions about the global qualities of teaching. <coughs> Was this teacher generally a good teacher? How much did I learn in this course or did I learn a lot? Was this course a very effective so those global questions don't are not process bound. They don't ask about <coughs> specific qualities. They really ask about your final impressions of, of the teacher. And those are the ones that um, are universal. You know, they're extraordinarily high in applicability universally. And also the validation evidence seems to support them as the most strongly related to teacher produce student learning. So for summative purposes, my strong opinion is that's what you use for summative purposes. I think you saw from all of the presenters, myself included, that there were real trepidations about using a specific uh, set of, of, of items that ask about things like friendliness, feedback, course objectives, timeliness, appearance, uh, enthusiasm, uh, organization, subject matter knowledge, which has been pointed out, can be very problematic for a, 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 a student to judge. Those judgments perhaps better made by the faculty hiring committees who have expertise to judge content knowledge. So it's, it's almost like for questions of that sort, uh, well, that's what the faculty and the administration do. They judge expertise, right? And the consumers judge how well that expertise is translated into teaching practices. So I am of the strong opinion that 
a rigid adherence to uh, you know uh, multi-dimensional rating scales is not generalizable across a wide variety of contexts, and increasingly not generalizable across the diverse methods of, of, of teaching that are now employed. Most of those multi-dimensional rating scales were developed 30, 40, even 50 years ago, uh, before, for example, cooperative learning methods were, were widely used, before student-centered strategies were widely used, before uh, technology-based instruction was widely used. Those instructional contexts are so different from each other that asking questions, for example, in a problem-based inquiry course about whether the instructor's skill in presentation was excellent, it's irrelevant. That's not what an instructor does in a student-centered course. He doesn't present. He facilitates. And so that's a more appropriate uh, uh, question. So those dimensional rating scales should not be used for summative purposes, period. I mean, if you want a clear takeaway, they should not be used for that purpose. So I've advocated you know, this cafeteria approach. So let me elaborate a little bit on the cafeteria approach. In a cafeteria approach, we have an item bank, much like you know, you know, we have test banks for uh, especially for survey courses where an instructor can go and select items to test the student's knowledge of the subject matter. Well, you can find uh, items banks for course evaluations that number in the hundreds. They're organized into categories. And so my suggestion is that's one of the things that an instructor can do in deciding, A, what what are the strategies that I use for teaching and what were some of the process that I believe were important? Now, that's great, but if you have absolutely no idea about how to teach and what to teach and when to teach and whom to teach, then you can get lost in a, in a system like that. So really the best strategy is to take a multi-dimensional scale and supplement with specific items of your own creation or from an item bank that you use to get good formative uh, feedback. And it's often best done, and this is another takeaway, this university should have an Office of Instructional Improvement where uh, faculty can go to work on their teaching. I mean, after all, Teaching is one of the three, you know, it's it's yeah. you know a, a, you know teaching, research, and and then in a tertiary way, service is important, right? But teaching and research are the heart of the institution. The institution needs to dedicate its resources to making sure that teaching is the best it can be. And how does it facilitate that? when instructors need to improve. So they have to put time and effort so that faculty don't feel that everything is on their shoulders, right? It's just like, you know, you have a, an office of, of computer technology here, right? Why? Because faculty themselves can't mount systems, right? You need, you need institutional support. So I think you need institutional support for teaching as well. It's a partnership. It's a partnership. To add to that, in fact, one of the things I've argued that doesn't happen, at least to have an optional course at the doctoral level, a pedagogy course, because the assumption is, oh, people, you know, by getting their doctorate, they know the area, but it doesn't necessarily mean they, could, they know how to teach it and deliver it. And so by, by having a course where those who are thinking of becoming teachers can go to and then Remember, remember the question I asked at the beginning of my presentation, how many of the faculty here had received specific mm -hmm. instruction in teaching methodologies? And I believe only one faculty member raised their hand. So they had to learn it on the job. Why? If teaching is among the most important things that faculty do, 
why, and, and this is especially true about graduate students, mm -hmm. our PhD students should receive training in instructional methodology. Not just from, from uh, being mentored by faculty whose only method of teaching is lecture. Because we know a tremendous amount about other methods of, of teaching. Cooperative learning methods, student-centered methods, problem-based learning, integration of technology. And there's a tremendous amount in the educational sciences about teaching and learning. Okay, you're all psychology students, so you've studied learning theories, you know, about behaviorism and cognitivism and constructivism. And how many of you know instructional theories? And there are many. And there are many instructional methods. So there's there are gaps in in institutional traditions that need to be corrected. So it's really not any institution which focuses on summative evaluation of teaching is bound to create a punitive system. Bound to create a punitive system. The system should focus on instructional improvement and about learning and about engaging faculty and administration and students in improving the quality of the academy. So formative assessment is where you start, and where you focus your energy and your efforts. Mm -hmm. And then you do some of this. <coughs> so a lot of what we talked about today, in fact, was wrong-headed. Because what did we focus on? We focused really on summative assessment. We focus on bias in ratings. Doesn't amount to hell beans. Like every other form of assessment, there is no perfect concern. So all of this concern, you know, I mean, my heyday, I'm a great young gentleman or not, my heyday was in the 80s, 90s. I can't believe that with 10,000 plus articles in this area, we're still asking basic questions about validity, utility, generalizability. There's thousands and thousands of articles already. We need to stop worrying about bias, about you know, gender bias, core selection bias. One tenth of one percent uh, uh, effect on uh, ratings variance. It all doesn't amount to ill beings. What matters is that inter institutional culture and context. That's what matters. Students are not the enemy. <laughs> this idea that we have to shelter students from course evaluation data is wrong. Students are the are they are the future. They are the future. And we need to coddle them while we make them work hard. See, before you ask a simple question, you've got a long answer. <laughs> you just told me I'm on tape. Okay, I have two questions for each of you. Good question. Uh, first of all, congratulations. All of you did an outstanding performance. And we're very glad about it. And um, my question is related really with the virtual education. We're involved in innovation project uh, to help students, final degree students, with the bi bibliography. So, uh, if, uh, have you got any experience at your university with such as this matter? And um, if not, uh, which is the percentage of virtual uh, learning versus face-to-face -face learning in each of your universities? The, the our experience of individual. Uh, yes, in virtual tools for helping a student, a final degree student with bibliography in campus. Well, I, 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 I can talk a little bit about, about virtual learning or distributed learning or part of the time. Um, I, I, I had the experience myself, uh, but there's also a lot of systematic reviews that my team has done 
Um, and, and so you can look at the literature on learning at a distance versus learning online and, um, and what makes for effective online learning. There's also a, a, a great series of, of, uh, of studies done by Richard Mayer about um, um, learning with technology. And the first thing about learning with technology is you have to understand, and here's, I'm talking to an audience of psychology, psychologists, so you know about dual process coding, right? Uh, great work done by a Canadian, right? Um, and with dual channel coding, encoding and decoding, what do we know? We know that if you process it, if you process consistent information in two channels, it's stored better and it's retrieved better. So the bottom line is learning from multimedia is more effective than learning from printed text alone. Or, or text with graphics is better than learning from text alone. But certainly multimedia presentations are better but then we can go one step further and say how much better learning is when it's from interactive multimedia, where the learner manipulates the content, right? And it's dynamic. So for example, we were talking before about um, you know, teaching one of the hardest basic concepts in introductory statistics is to teach the central limit theory and to teach about population sampling and, oh my God, the sampling distribution, right? People just don't get that. And you can pull your hair out and do demonstrations. Well, in fact, while I still won't claim that for students it's easy, when you can demonstrate the effect of sample size on, on, on sampling distributions dynamically with the bird, uh, with the with the use of visuals that change as you change the sample size, then people go, aha, I get it, I see it. So interactive multimedia used appropriately, used according to research and evidence-based principles, has tremendous advantages over, over straight lecturing, right? So we can take advantage of, 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 of that. And, uh, we can take advantage of, of strategies which use um, blended learning and online learning in, in specific ways. But it's, it's, it's not the magic bullet. And if you, if you look now carefully at the research on MOOCs, so MOOCs, you know, this, these massive online uh, courses, big bugs, big bugs, right? Everybody jumped on the bandwagon. And as quickly as they if they jumped on, they're jumping off. Why? Because learning cannot be done on the cheap. And what good learning requires is opportunities for learners to dialogue and opportunities for learners to dialogue with the faculty or the instructional support system. And you just can't do that on the cheap. So places that went whole hog for, for MOOCs failed after a year. And the evidence on their impact is failing, right? But that is not to throw out online learning. Online learning can be tremendously useful if you follow evidence-based instructional practices, starting with the right use of interactive multimedia. Did that answer your question? Yes. Just Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still on tape. Just the second one. Which is the percentage in Canada? You, you agree, maybe is increasing, but which is exactly, for, in your opinion, the percentage of virtual learning in Canada or in the other universities? That's quite the second question. Of online learning in Canada? Uh, you know what? That, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. <coughs> But if I had to guess, 15 to 25 percent, some form of more blended learning where you do some yes. lectures and some online. And the tools are, you know, okay, but they're not, uh, 
they're not there yet. They're just okay. The tools to support life that don't reconnect. It's okay. Yeah, just a couple of points then uh, to add to what um, you said, um, which I agree with. Um, Fish about motor media. Um, you know, one of the evidence bases is that having a presence, very, very important to have a presence in the virtual learning class because if it's just, you know, um, <clears throat> what you call it, asynchronous, where you put something down and then whenever days later or hours later the student responds and it just goes like that, the, the interaction there is minimal. Um, um, in terms of <clears throat> multimedia, going a step further, we have so much technology out there that is not used in, in a classroom. I give an example. I'm going to go to, to the, talk about prime, uh, talk about secondary school for a second. A couple of years ago, I had the pleasure of teaching, co-teaching the class with one of my favorite colleagues, Hannah Gerber, who is making a big name for herself in video gaming. So she developed a video game curriculum. Um, one of the leading people in the field now in that area. And she went into, we went into a school, it was a really tough school, where everyone in the class was a failing student. And so she developed this video game curriculum, of which I had a component of it, where I went in and I taught them the methods. So here I, here I am teaching 10th grade students, you know, about 16 years old, 15, 16 years old, mixed methods that I teach at the doctoral level. And in fact, when I was telling them, oh, I teach this in my doctoral class, they, they thought I was joking at first, you know, really, it was really true. And it would really compliment, so example, um, one of the things, you know, one of the games based there, they, they, they had to develop uh, their avatar and, and, and their game. So I went in one day and I, in fact, it just happened straight after the Boston, the Boston uh, bombing um, that happened. And I remember coming that, that next day and I said, okay, today I'm gonna teach you some, two, something that's gonna, one, could save your life, and B, get you more dates. Of course, that, that made them interesting, because remember, these are the low achieving, who don't, you know, don't even want to be in class. I told them about the Boston bombing and saying that, you know, we talked talk about what happened in Paris, the, 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 the breaking news about the person who had to sufficiently wanted to go into the, the game, the, Paris, the France game, and didn't get in because he was sufficiently so that's all that non-verbal communication that he was given off uh, that may have saved you know, hundreds of people, if not more. And, uh, and so he talked about, you know, using all those fancy terms, proxemics or chronemics and paralinguistics and all of that in the class. And these, again, are, are failing students. <coughs> and then I said, okay, look at your video game and what non-verbal communication do you want your avatar to display? Um, and, and, and stuff like that. So they got to learn it, thinking that it was fun. And, and so if you could teach in a, in a way to them that learning is fun, um, you're going to get more learning. Uh, fast forward it to the, or making it higher up now to our level, doctoral level. I mean, it still amazes me that we tell our students to go, you know, to either go to a library or look online, print out the stuff, or read it and go from there. And there's so few people, for example, take advantage of the software in your literature review to upload your articles. So I, I tell my students that you should be using qualitative software to upload your articles. And then you code it that way. Uh, the technology is there, and we don't often tell them to use it. So much you can do with iPads, so much you can do with iPhones, so much you can, so you can make learning fun. They are, when you teach statistics, you know, instead of just only giving them the formula to conduct a uh, power analysis or something, there are, you know, some apps out there you can use that they could, they could bang that off very quickly. So, you know, it's good that they know what's going on, but beyond that, most of them are not trained to be professors of methodology. We're trained them to be able to use statistics in their meaningful way. So, so using the tools out there that they would use in everyday post, everyday lives, is going to get much better results than the old-fashioned, like you call it, chalk and talk. In terms of percentage in the U.S., in the in your top schools, <coughs> because people will go to those schools because they're famous. So, example in. In Texas, we have two schools. One's called University of Texas at Austin, and one's called uh, Texas A&M. They're tier one schools, as they're called. People go there because of the name. So they don't have the pressure, like my school, Sam Houston, to teach online classes. Um, and so schools like mine, across the US, it's almost now like you're crazy if you don't teach virtual classes. Because it's then hard to compete for the for students if you don't teach an online class because more and more students like the idea of learning from a distance. And we even have now in our classes people from all over the world. 
Um, and so I can't give the exact, I used to know the percentage, um, but I, I can look it up later, but uh, it's, it's, it's high it's, and it's increasing. And so in, like in our department, almost everyone teaches an online class at some point, whether you like it or not, because you know, it pays our bills. <laughs> Yeah, my institution, uh, the percentage, is, uh, I think, is zero. Yeah. Teaching online classes. And I think we're just starting with it uh, mm -hmm. in Belgium. So maybe in one or two uh, courses, there will be some kind of uh, online uh, classes. But, uh, okay. Not really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And well, we, we, we were thinking about well, MOOCs, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe I should go back. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. I am very sorry. <laughs> At least three people in this room, we work for the public uh, Spanish Open University, and uh, I'm happy to tell you, but I'm not, I do not know really if I am happy, but I can tell you that more than half of the students who do psychology in Spain do systems <coughs> education systems. More than half. So it means that our faculty has more students, psychology students, that, than all other psychology faculties in Spain together. Wow. That gives you an idea. Uh, no, I mean all university, universities, no, all faculties. Faculty, I think, increasing, but in Spain, I guess, it's not very high. The, the, well, the, the, the whole level. of the university has more students than Complutense University. It gives you also an idea of how big it is. It's more than 30 years old now, so we're not newcomers. <laughs> and just to provide a caveat to what we said earlier about the importance of um, faculty development, um, f starting from the doctoral level onwards, I would, ask, I would argue that there should also be student development. Because I've had students who take my virtual classes who have no idea about technology. And that's a real problem for them. And they take it out on you because they think it's your fault, they shouldn't know. So having at least an orientation, an optional orientation for students, um, very uh, day one of their of their program, um, so that they, they know the basics of you know of technology. Well let me take that a step further. Um, at, most, at most institutions in North America, uh, if a student is really falling uh, behind and getting in trouble. There are uh, remedial courses uh, that cover basic learning strategies. So again, you know, you guys are in psychology. You know that there is quite a large uh, collection of, of learning strategies that, that students can use: mnemonic devices, concept mapping strategies, use of portfolios, and so on and, and so forth. There's actually quite a huge collection of these things. And one of the things I do in my graduate course on learning is at the beginning of the semester, I, I ask each of the students in my class, how many of you know of these strategies and how many of you were actually taught how to use them well? And by the time I finish, there are no hands up. I think it's absolutely amazing that you have been in school for 20 years, two decades, and nobody has taught you how to learn. They have taught you what to learn, but they haven't taught you how to learn. And that's not shame on you, that's shame on us. That should be mandatory at the, well, it should be mandatory before students come to university, but certainly should be mandatory for all students as an orientation right at the beginning of, of the university. Learning how to learn. Mm -hmm. Not learning what to learn, learning how to learn. I'm still on tape, eh? <laughs> <laughs> About online and uh, teach and teaching assessment, uh, there is something happening uh, which is uh, which worries us. Uh, one of the problems when you do this teaching assessment online is that 
as usual, we do not have very many responses from students. Uh, but there is also a variable, which is an important variable, and we do not have control over it, and it is that many of these students have access to social networks, and a small group of them can have a dramatic impact mm -hmm. in the quality of your assessment if they decide to do so. Uh, which perhaps is not happening in conventional uh, universities, but it is happening in distance mm -hmm. education institutions. And uh, so you have the paradox of simultaneously increasing the reliability of your assessment because many more people participate, but uh, simultaneously you decrease the validity of it because it is a biased assessment promoted by a group, a small group of people. Mm -hmm. And we, it's, it's difficult to, to work in that, to solve that kind of puzzle. But it is happening. But it doesn't concern online learning alone. Eh? It no, no, concerns no. every yeah, aspect of university yeah. teaching. I think uh, in traditional yeah, programs the, the, as well, the students can get can, can all, are all they are all the Facebook. The problem is when you get groups of people whose only communication means ah, okay. is online. Mm -hmm. So if, if you do, if you try to do this here, it can work. In, in, I mean, in a conventional institution, but. They also meet at the cafeteria, they meet in the corridors, they have friends, so it is possible to counterbalance or to counteract this influence. If they only communicate through social networks, you have no means to, to, yeah. to, to, to counter. Well, Ole, again, goes back to what you said about um, making, making the process transparent as possible and give them a reason why, because the normal response is, I think a lot of time, like the question of the yard special given to someone said, I have no idea what happens to it. That That is a concern. And and, and so so then we shouldn't be surprised that quite a significant proportion don't, don't complete it if they think it's pretty much a waste of time. Uh, if they could learn, to, <coughs> if they could see the relation between their responses and the improvement in our teaching um, over time, because they shape the, uh, at the graduate level, where they're going to be taking, they might take you more than one, so at least they're going to be taking, you know, they're going to be there for um, a, a suitable amount of time taking high level courses. I think that that could help to increase response rates. Um, so. Yeah, so Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.